Well, I want you to know that I had a wonderful trip over today. Uh, it was, you know, it 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 is. Uh, it took about uh, three hours to get over here, two hours 45, something like that. But it's a nice ride. It really is a beautiful day and a nice ride, nice scenery. And so it's, uh, it's very good to uh, be uh, with you today. And, uh, <clears throat> ah, yes. And I guess the first thing we do the meditation we have on here. Oh, that's me. Oh, that's you. Okay. And uh, well, okay. And we'll have. A, it's just good to be here this morning. And at this time, we'll have a little uh, a music meditation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Charlie, that's very nice. Very nice. Thank you very much. Um, what I would like to do is have an opening prayer and uh, begin as a worship. So uh, I'll have a little opening prayer, and then together we'll do the call to worship. Father God, as we come before you today, it is with great, great joy uh, and anticipation of what you're going to do in our lives, in our communities and our country, uh, across all nations, globally, uh, what you're going to do today, Father. Uh, we seek your, your face, we seek to follow you, we seek to do exactly what you would have us to do as part of your kingdom. So as we do that, we, uh, we pray together um, this morning. Uh, our call to worship is... Almighty God in heaven, who created the heavens, the earth, humankind, and everything there is, we come before you today in a spirit of thanksgiving, praise, and joyful anticipation of what you're going to do next in our personal and corporate lives together as a church. We worship you, the one true 
living God and look forward to what you would have us learn, experience, and be encouraged with today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, great. Our hymn is uh, Holy, 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 uh, number 193. Let's all, uh, do we stand and do that? Uh, hymns, if you do. If uh, that's good, if you don't, that's good too. Let's turn to hymn number 193, Holy, Holy, Holy. today is John, 1 John 1, verse 9. <clears throat> if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purity purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. May God bless the hearing and reading of his holy word this day. Uh, individual confession time will do right in silence right now.
And my brothers and sisters, we do have a God who is always eager to forgive us our sins. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when I talk to people and try and lead them to Christ, I say every sin you ever committed was in the future when Jesus died on the cross. So every sin that you will commit has been forgiven already. Of course, if you truly believe that, you will not seek to use that as a license to sin. You would never want to do that to a God who so graciously has already forgiven us. So in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, we see, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our scripture reading today is taken from the book of Acts, and I'll be reading it in the, uh, from the uh, New International Version, and <clears throat> it's Acts 11, verses 1 through 8. And Peter has just got done with his first missionary tour and he's telling uh, the rest of the apostles and the brothers um, what has happened to him. The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. And Peter began to explain everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals on the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. Then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The Lord spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. Th these six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and had said and say, send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered with what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think I could oppose God? Then when they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. May God add his uh, blessing to the hearing and reading of his holy word this day. Let's all turn to hymn number 195 in your hymnal and uh, stand if you're able uh, and we'll do uh, Come Thou Almighty King, 195. We cannot sing, sir. What's that? We cannot sing. Oh, we're not supposed to sing? You can. We can. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, you don't want to hear my solo voice. <clears throat> uh, Charlie can sing it. Yeah, Charlie, you sing it. All right, if Charlie will sing it, I'll sing it. Thank you. 
it apart to the great one in three eternal praises be hence evermore thy sovereign majesty we in glory see and to eternity At this time, I would ask the ushers that would come forward and take up this morning's offering. Instead of, instead of offering this morning with the ushers at the end of the service, if you would like to put your envelope. Oh, okay. I think someone told me that. Yes. I think they're doing that in our home church, too. Uh, well, all right. Uh, we can do that then. Go ahead, Charlie. be seated. Well, it says you're supposed to stand, but you can sit. <laughs> Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we just take these gifts uh, at the end of the service that will be there. And Father, before they give them, we pray right now that you would use them for your glory. Multiply them like the loaves and fishes, Lord. Uh, take them and use them wisely. Uh, we know you will. We know that as we give to you in your name that you will take those gifts and, and make them really count. Uh, none of it will be wasted, not even one red cent. So we're so thankful uh, that we have the opportunity to do this and uh, we give you all the, all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, uh, I want to know from you, what are some of the prayer requests that you have uh, that we need to pray for? There is Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
You know, I can always uh, remember my grandmother always calling Memorial Day Decoration Day. And as a uh, young 10 year old, I would always correct her and say, well, but Grandma, it, in school, they tell us it's Memorial Day. And she would answer and say, well, we were always taught that it was called Decoration Day. And, uh, I, I, you know, after many years uh, reading and, and looking for sermon and il illustrations and whatnot as a pastor, I, uh, I found out in reading that it was, it was in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, that soldiers, after this is right after the Civil War, soldiers from both sides of the conflict were buried. And it was a tradition to decorate the graves of the fallen with flowers and whatever they had. And I found a story about it that touched my soul. The Gettysburg women would go out and decorate the graves of the Union soldiers every year. And uh, on one of those occasions, one of the women, seeing the graves of the Confederate soldiers, rather unkempt and forgotten, began putting flowers on the Confederate graves, telling her cohort they were American boys too. So the story spread like wildfire, and I'm sure it influenced my grandmother and many others of her generation's insistence on calling the day Decoration Day. Decoration Day. So as we, um, as we do this in our time today, uh, we're going to see that God does wonderful things, brand new, that we haven't known before. Uh, Peter, as we see in the scripture, Peter was called to go to a Gentile house. In Jewish culture, you never did that. You never did that. You never ate with Gentiles. Um, and, you know, the, the, when Peter comes back, we see that the expressions, you know, the response of the Jewish Christians was mixed in our passage we read in Acts. The expression circumcised believers, and it's always used in uh, chapter 10, verse 45 of Acts, it evidently describes Christians who still held to the law of Moses. Those guys were around in, in chapter 15, verse 5. They're, uh, they're there in chapter 21, verse 20. They're there. And also in Galatians 2, 2, 2, 12, it says, Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. And that was, you know, that was the Apostle Paul talking about that. Uh, how that was bad. Hey, you know, either you, you, uh, if a person's a Christian, you eat with them, whether it doesn't matter what they are. You know, uh, the, accus the accusation lodged against Peter was that he went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. You see, the problem was not his preaching to Gentiles, but his eating with them. Eating a meal with somebody was big stuff back in the first century AD. As a matter of fact, a lot of uh, Asian culture, uh, Eastern cultures, and also early on in Europe, it, it was a big thing. If you broke bread with somebody, that was a big thing. That's why we do communion. It's a big thing to break bread with somebody. I, I, I've got to tell you, you know, my wife's Italian. She loves to cook for people. And, and everything. And we went down one time uh, to the hat shell on July 4th weekend with uh, Marty and Fetty Day Wilson. Now Marty is son of, uh, uh, Marty Wilson is a, a, a Christy Wilson's son. Christy Wilson's famous uh, missionary. 
uh, spent 17 years in Iran as a missionary in Iraq and he, he taught uh, missions courses and uh, Gordon Conwell Seminary for a long time and I met Mar Marty working with him uh, on the night shift in an oil distribution company. Uh, we were both working there in between things that oh, I wasn't working in between. That was the only job I had. But at any rate, we became friend, became friends with him, and uh, we we said we'll go down to the Hatch Shell together, July Fourth for the concert. Well, we got there, and my wife had a couple of sandwiches in a bag, uh, you know, and, and it, it, we could pass out. She had them wrapped up so that we'd have some food there. They had this 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 container, just like a bag, but. When they opened it, it was this beautiful, beautiful silver platter. And it had all this food arranged just beautifully on it. And uh, we had made, uh, we'd gotten, uh, it was going to rain, so we had gotten sticks from a construction site across the road and made a little tent, uh, kind of with uh, 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 the, the, the um, Garbage bags, we ripped them apart and kind of made a little tent uh, there so that we could get underneath there. But she put on this beautiful display of a beautiful, uh, big, huge silver, silver platter with all this stuff arranged in it, vegetables and stuff. And I was, whoa, what is this? But you see, in Eastern cultures and in biblical cultures, having a meal with somebody was big stuff. It was really big stuff to, le to let somebody into your house and to eat with them. That was important. Those were important things. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we, we didn't really, but we were, we were very glad that we were able to do that. But it showed me that, you know, in, in Eastern cultures, ancient cultures, eating with someone was a big deal. And so that's what all the fuss here is with Peter. You know, you went and ate with Gentiles. You, you, we don't do that. Yeah, he said he did. Uh, and then, you know, that gives greater significance to Peter's vision. He's had this vision that all this stuff has come down and, and, and the, God says, Peter, slay and eat. And he's just very upset about that and said, I don't know whether I can do that or not. And how am I going to do that, oh God? And so, uh, it, but because eating is a mark of acceptance and fellowship, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, uh, Paul says, But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler, with such a man, do not even eat. Okay, you're not supposed to even eat a meal with him. Uh, and of course, by the way, that problem could have caused a serious break in the church. But that's what Paul says. You know, eating with someone was a big deal. And so Peter has to explain his actions for about eating with these people. And so he tells them what has happened to him. He had a vision and he went and ate in this man's house. He went to Cornelius's house and ate. And uh, you know because he did this that was we see the Lord, the Holy Spirit opening up salvation not only to uh, Jews but to the Gentiles. We're seeing the movement of the Holy Spirit and the church becoming just not uh, Gentiles who have converted to Judaism, but to Gentiles all through people, the Roman government, the Roman soldiers who were hated. The church is opening up to all these things. And they're a little bit scared and nervous as we all are with new ministries. If you read any of successful ministries anywhere in the history of the church, the first thing they have is fear. 
because you know our 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 adversary doesn't want us to have confidence or doesn't want us to have boldness in proclaiming the gospel so you have fear but fearful and are not in trepidation we put one foot in front of the other and we follow god so peter peter has an answer he says listen uh and and verses 4 through 17 he recounted to them the circumcised believers in uh, to the circumcised believers in jerusalem these were christians you know but these were we know christians like that today there are certain high churches that do this you know they they believed that yes christ died on the cross for your sins uh but you got to do your part haven't you heard that? You might have heard that in some Baptist circles. You got to do your part. Well, what, what's your part? Your part is saying thank you and listening to God's spirit and walking with him. That's your part. So uh, they would agree with that, but they say you have to earn the rest of it. God earned most of it, but you know, you're going to have to earn the rest of it. You're going to have to do your part. Well, really, uh, you know, your part is to say, I'm a sinner and I can't do anything on my part and that's that's the first step and then walking and following god uh you know uh, his his trip to cornelius's house was only in obedience to god god was doing a new thing god was opening up salvation to everyone whosoever will and nobody understood that now, in recounting what happened with Peter, Peter made an important identification on the day of Pentecost with the Lord's prediction of spirit baptism, that you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit, just like they were. And Luke didn't state specifically in chapter 2 that Pentecost was that fulfillment, but here Peter pointedly said so by the phrase, at the beginning, okay? at the beginning just as we have and in uh, chapter 11 verse 17 he says the same gift he gave us the same gift he gave up the church age then began on the day of pentecost and peter's defense didn't rest on what he himself did but on what god did god had made no distinction between jew and gentile so how could Peter how could Peter with Peter the Saints recognized that the conversion of the Gentiles was initiated by God and that they could they should not stand in his way if you see God doing something and you know it's God and it does you know you don't you don't like it don't worry about it it's God's problem um, first you know that kind of response that Peter had, that kind of response when you do it that way, has two ensuing and significant results. First, it preserved the unity of the body of Christ, the church. Second, it, it did drive a wedge between church uh, age believers and the temple worshipers in Jerusalem. Before this, the common Jewish people looked on Christians with favor uh, you know, but soon thereafter, the Jews opposed the church. That, now, that kind of antagonism is attested by Israel's response to the execution of James. In chapter 12, verse 2 through 3, you see, they were glad that James was martyred. They were very glad. And, uh, you know, perhaps this uh, kind of uh, uh, course with the Gentiles was a starting point of uh, the Jewish uh, the Jewish opposition that eventually made the break between Christians and Jews. You see, Christ is for everybody. Christ is for the people, especially for the people who feel that uh, they've lost things up in their life. You ever feel like you're a screw up? I have messed a lot of things up and the devil tries to use that against me. But I know, and you need to know, if you don't already, that you just say, this is the one time you can do it in your lives. You tell the devil to go to a very hot place. 
Tell, that's his home. Tell him to go back home. Tell him go to Hades. Hell. That's his home. Tell him to go back home and leave you alone. That's his home. And you can tell him that. And, uh, you know, welcome to the club of all believers in Christ. Uh, God's, God's just keeping, keeping us humble when we feel like that. Don't let that stand in the way of the great things that God has got for you personally, for every committee you're on here, for this church. This is a wonderful church, all right? And, you know, I'm gonna, I, I want to I tell you a little, little story. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, you know, by the way, don't judge a book by its cover. You, you've heard that. Don't judge a book by its cover. Uh, don't judge yourself by your cover, okay? When I was a kid, about 12 years old, I must have been about 11 or 12, my dad was working in Ford Motor Company, and I worked there too for 15 years before I got the call to ministry. But my dad was working as a forklift operator. First he started out what they call a spring bender. That was a tough job, but he got, eventually became a forklift operator after a few years, and uh, he was working what we called the afternoon shift. Started at 3.30 in the afternoon. Never saw my father growing up much, you know, because he was working two jobs. He was working another job with a, uh, driving a milk truck on the weekend, and uh, during the week he was working the afternoon shift, which was he came in at 3 or 3.30 in the afternoon. I was in school, and I just never saw him. And then he'd be working on the weekend, too. Uh, and uh, so I, I just didn't see him much. I saw him somewhat, but I, I can remember uh, him telling the story. He came home uh, after the night. He told it to my mother, but he told me the next day. Uh, he told me the story that had happened. He supplied, uh, they have big 100-ton presses in, in the press shop. They called it the press shop section of the where they stamped out the radiator tanks you know it's just a, a strip a ribbon of of copper or brass that goes through it's it's uh it's the uh, the brass that goes through and they stamp the the the, the radiators out the, the bottom and the top and at the header job i used to put on the bottoms of them when they brought them over but my father used to supply uh or pick up them in a basket in a, in, a, in a forklift and bring them out to us. They'd been stamped out and we could put them on the radiator cores. Well, he was working uh, the afternoon shift and uh, what happened was those, those uh, presses were uh, big and they'd go down and they'd come up and uh, there was something on inside that the operator, the press operator, didn't like it. It would go down and come up, and you had time to go and grab something in there. Well, what happened was he thought he could do that, the operator. And so he took his, he took his hand, and as the press went up like that, and this is a, this is a 60, 000, 60 ton or 100 ton press, as it went up, he reached in to grab this little piece of brass that was in there. It's going to mess up the whole. And when he did, he didn't realize as it went up and as it before it came down, there was a little bar that came down first to hold the brass. And what happened was the bar came down right on that finger. Right on that finger. And so the press was going to come down, and he was able to take his hand and hit the stop button on that press. Here his hand is. And he didn't know what to do. He couldn't get it out, because that, that little finger bar was right there. That was uh, holding his hand. So the foreman gathered around, the, 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 the general foreman of the department uh, gathered around, and they didn't know what to do. 
And they, they, by the way, the press, the big heavy part of the press, it's slowly coming down as the hydraulic fluid it just drains out of that part and it's coming down, going to come down on his hand. Slowly but surely, it's coming down little by little. So they didn't know what to do. So they got a hold of an elect the electrician that was on duty that night. And the electrician, in a very heroic way, was, you know, under a time constraint, rewired that press backwards out of his head. And just looking at the schematic, he rewired that press backwards. So that, so that when they hit the on button to start it, instead of coming down and cycling and taking this guy's arm off, that it would go back up because it was going to go backwards instead of down. So they finished doing it. He spent, his, however long it took, he scrambled and did it. And they said to the guy whose arm was there, what do you want us to do? He said, what else am I going to do? Hit it. And they hit that button, and it went up, and he got his hand out. Okay. That was quite the story. Now, a few, uh, uh, quite a few years later, about seven years later, I was 18 years old, and I started working there. Okay. I started working at Ford Motor Company, and I was working what they call the header job. I was out by the main aisle and uh, on the assembly line. And uh, this guy comes up, and we have the basket of stock right there. And he's got kind of an engineer's coat on, but he's a real geeky looking guy. You know, he's got. Uh, Coke bottle glasses, a, a big horn rim, black horn rim glasses, and his teeth are a little bit buck, and he's, you know, he's kind of dumpy, you know, short, and a beer belly, and he, you know, he's got his hair, it's kind of a mess, and it's kind of balding on the top, and kind of a weird looking little guy, and, and, and he, he says, hey, hey, kid, and I, so it's, there's a real din in an auto plant when you're working there, all right? He says, hey, kid. I, I looked at him, he says, he says, hey, you Jimmy Harrington's kid? And I said, yeah, yeah, I am. He says, yeah, yeah, you, you look like your old man, you know that? You look like your father. I said, oh, okay, yeah. He says, uh, yeah, he says, uh, I, you know, I'm Joe, Joe Campisi. He says, tell your, tell your old man I said hi, will you? And I said, all right, yeah, I, I will do that. And uh, so I went home, I, you know, young single guy, I went home to my parents last night and had supper. And I said to my father, hey, you know, I, this weird little guy, you know, this crazy little guy, you know, uh, came up and he said he, he knows you. And I said, you know, he, he's kind of strange, you know, and he's a dumpy little guy, you know. Uh, his name is Joe Campisi. And my father says, yeah, Joe. He said, yeah, he said, hi. I said, I, I, I thought it was kind of weird, uh, that guy. And my father then told me who he was. He was the guy that rewired the press backwards. You can't judge a book by its cover. You can't judge a person by its cover. You can't judge a church by its cover. You can't judge a school by its cover. So I want you to know today that God loves you with a fierce love and loves this church. And God has got great plans for this church. I want you to know that. This is a beautiful church building got a beautiful congregation and God's got a beautiful future for you beautiful future and when you think about it as you, as you deal with the budget and everything else that you have to deal with in this church I want you to think of Joe Campisi he didn't seem like much but he was great and God used him greatly 
and God's going to use you greatly. Okay? The hymn is to be announced uh, this day. Uh, Number 330, It Is Well With My Soul, 330. Let's turn to that and all... Uh, the benediction now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before 
his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.